idealistic, the young must believe that the world should be more just and there should be more moral rectitude in the behavior of their leaders. What will be the nature of the upcoming American dictatorship? This is the single most pressing question of our time, and its answer will shape the future of our country and of the world. But first, we should answer the obvious precursor question, why will there be an American dictator? It has to do simply with the convergence of the underlying nature of our democratic representative form of government, along with the current political climate. But I'll start with the former. Now, there's nothing wrong, per se, with democratic representative governments. Given the right parameters, there's nothing wrong with any form of government, or at the very least, they can all be made to work. Representative democracies in particular do work most of the time, that is to say, within most countries and during most time periods, and offer many benefits. First off, the limits that representative governments impose upon themselves, which make them weaker, are most of the time of a benefit to the state and its people as government should only hold the minimum power necessary to enact the will of its people, and any excess leads to tyranny. Secondly, these governments tend to avoid being excessively bad. Over the years, their performance tends towards the average, because of the number of people involved in government as well as their constant turnover. No one person ever gets the opportunity to affect the quality that the government can provide too much. The quality will vary year to year and will be affected more profoundly by more important offices, but it will always be very close to this average level of quality. Now this benefit could actually be said to be the greatest benefit that these types of governments can provide. They all but guarantee a not stellar, but always serviceable quality of governance. And so long as you live in a stable country, usually situations do not arise which are beyond the competency of these governments to handle. Consequently, this same argument can be used to illustrate why less stable, less developed countries should wish for autocrats who will be much more capable of handling the much more frequent and dire crises that face those nations. Conversely, it can be used to illustrate why anarchy could be considered as the ultimate form of government, assuming of course that the people of the nation are all flawlessly godlike in their behavior, and no crises ever face them. Given this framework, you can perhaps see the reason I predict the rise of the American dictator. At times, crises can simply be too difficult for these governments of average quality to handle, even in more stable countries. So occasionally, if we wish to save the state, more on this later, we need to implement a model which can rise to the occasion, hence dictatorship. For the simple fact that the dictator holds all of the power and can get done absolutely anything which needs doing, he can be considered to be the most effective form of government possible. Effective being defined as accurately representing the will of the people. Conversely, and for the same reasons, a dictator also has the potential to provide the absolute worst quality of government. This makes the office of dictator a sort of last-ditch effort, a terrible tool to be used only in times of extreme crisis, where all alternatives have already proven ineffective. But then just look at the state of our country. We have civil strife, which states are either incapable or unwilling to deal with, an increasing crime rate for the first time in decades, Uncontrolled immigration and some 20 plus million illegals which our current president wants to see made into citizens. This is not to mention the deeper foundational rot of our country, including our banking system, which gives unfettered control of our economy to the elites, where they are free to choose winners and losers in a nepotistic orgy of our money. A military industrial complex who regularly commits atrocities half a world away in the name of defense, and a state-compliant media, 
who seems inept at informing the public, yet shows great skill in creating division. All of these cracks are reaching ahead. These are not problems which the wise man ignores. The people know something is going on, even if most will not fully recognize it until it has already come. I propose, not lightly so, but the time has come to utilize this most terrible of tools. But given that I only just mentioned that dictators can provide the greatest variance in quality of governance, having the potential to represent the very best and the very worst, it would behoove anyone looking to implement a dictatorship to have some way to check his power. But how might you ask, would it even be possible to check absolute power? The idea of affording emergency state powers to the most efficient decision-making group possible, one man, is far from a new one, of course. The standard example of a state implementing this idea would be Rome, the place from which we get the word dictator. During times of crisis in the Republic, their constitution would be temporarily suspended, and all state power would be vested in the person of the dictator, who could do practically anything he needed to in order to get the job done. This institution created some of the most legendary figures of Roman history, the most famous of whom being Cincinnatus, Sulla, and Julius Caesar, all of whom were also beloved in their own time, proof that the office of dictator is not synonymous with tyrant nor despot, and that fear of such a governmental office is nothing more than a cowardly submission to the modern propaganda which touts democracy as absolute. How then did Rome ensure that the sanctity of the Republic, and in turn the people's sovereignty, would be maintained after appointing a dictator? Not that this is a course we would even necessarily need to take. One could simply disregard the sanctity of the Republic, as the Romans did for nearly five centuries during the time of the Empire, emperors being close enough to the imprecise definition of dictator to arguably fit that bill. But during the time of the Republic, they utilized another very simple solution. Recognizing that power tends to beget more power over time, they simply limited the time for which dictators could wield power. Typically, they were given six months in order to accomplish some task, after which time they were stripped of their dictatorial powers. And I will note that almost always, the men would relinquish power before their time was up, something that was viewed as a sign of virtue, being able to relinquish absolute power as soon as it was no longer necessary for them to wield. Another means of limiting a dictator's power, one not implemented in Rome, is to bestow the ability for some group, a senate or judges for example, to strip the dictator of his power were he no longer fulfilling his mandate in their eyes. This type of dictator, first defined by Carl Schmitt, would be called a commissary dictator. Someone who does not wield ultimate sovereignty in and of themselves. Someone whose continued power is contingent upon him fulfilling a mandate as judged by some external group. While he wields the power necessary to resolve the crisis, if he ever starts to provide a poor quality of government, he can be easily removed. Or simply put, if the dictator were to slip into this part of the graph, he could be removed by a third party. While we may be less familiar with these types of dictators, they are arguably the more common sort in recorded history. Now there are also many other methods by which a dictator's power can be checked if he begins to become tyrannical all of which should be considered. But suffice it to say that these above two proposals of time limits and commissary appointment have been proven to work. And most historical dictators, while wielding enough power to accomplish their given task, did not have a monopoly on sovereignty like we think dictators today have. If the citizens of the US are interested in maintaining our current system of law and defending the US Constitution, then the only solution to the modern social crisis is the appointment of a commissary dictator as described above, someone who rules at the whim of some other ultimate wielder of sovereignty. This is the course which I advocate and the one which I will be attempting to convince you of in the rest of this video. The precise details of how this commissary dictatorship would function in practice are up for debate, but to give you a rough idea of how it might possibly work, the Senate or a collection of states would first be required to vote to amend the Constitution, creating the office of dictator, electable by some means. The electing body, be it Congress as a whole or the Senate alone, would then vote emergency executive powers to the dictator for a set period of time. There would then only exist three methods by which the dictator could lose his power, 
First and foremost would be the possibility of removal by some set of judges, perhaps actual legal judges on the Supreme Court, who could remove the dictator if they determined that he was no longer serving his mandate, no longer protecting the Constitution. Secondly, he would be stripped of his power if his given time as dictator elapsed. And lastly, of course, he could relinquish power himself before his given time had elapsed. But now we need to address some other, I'm sure to most people, seemingly more likely scenarios. Namely, what about the possibility of total collapse? What if the citizens of the U.S. decide that their differences were irreconcilable, that they cannot live under a common law, and that the U.S. Constitution, for all intents and purposes, should become void? If the U.S. does not proactively impose a commissary dictatorship, one sanctioned by law, this is the other foremost scenario, and one which, absent any intervention, I view as an eventuality rather than just a possibility. Now, luckily for my prediction that the U.S. will see a dictatorship soon, it is also a scenario which would lead to a dictatorship, for the simple fact that power vacuums tend to be filled first by crude forms of government, as it takes time for more complex systems to be formed and for social trust and cohesion to reform, both of which are necessary precursors to statehood. But then if you want a dictatorship, and it's an inevitability either way, why bother with the effort to proactively implement a commissary dictatorship? Why not let collapse happen and let the dictator come that way? What's the difference? Well, to begin, in this scenario of collapse, the resultant dictatorship would almost assuredly be violent, and importantly, its providence would be difficult to predict. While a native of the U.S. could rise to power, it's more likely that a foreign power would look to take advantage of a disorganized land, and we would see a harsh imposition of its power upon us. Perhaps the dictator you like happens to be the one which takes power, but any way you look at it, this presents a massive and unnecessary risk to the long-term sovereignty of the people of the U.S. Now, some of you may think that collapse is far and away the more likely scenario as compared to my idea of a commissary dictatorship. This very well may be the case. We may experience a breakdown of current U.S. law long before our government could ever enact such legislation as would be necessary to legally appoint a dictator to defend the Constitution. But given the chaos that would ensue from plunging ourselves into utter lawlessness, is this really the outcome we should desire? Hundreds of groups would overnight be vying for control over people and land, forced to leverage the only means of political power available to them, violence. Again, you may wishfully imagine that after a breakdown of law, the exalted hero will rise up to lead his people to ultimate victory. But consider then what would be the strength of such an initially disorganized rabble as compared to, say, China who would assuredly wish to capitalize on the show of weakness coming from their greatest rival. I, for my part, say that once we recognize the oncoming storm, it is cowardice to resign ourselves to the damages it will cause. And conversely, it is bravery, perhaps even just prudence, to attempt to save ourselves and our family and our friends from the havoc. For this reason, I think a commissary dictatorship, which is appointed by officials in the government to defend the U.S. Constitution, is the preferable option. It allows us to get through this period of social crisis and to come out on the other end all the better for it, while maintaining as powerful of a front as possible against foreign enemies. To be clear, the Constitution would be suspended, and absolute executive power would be placed in the hands of one man, but it would only be done in order to save the Constitution which is, I believe, a sound enough basis of law for any government and, as such, is worth defending, a few amendments notwithstanding, perhaps. Tangentially, I'll add that I believe that, even if a dictator were to take power by force, they would still benefit, at least a bit, if they still chose to recognize the Constitution, it being always better to have a common basis of government with which everyone is already familiar. So the ideal solution would be the passing of an amendment to the Constitution which allows for the appointment of dictators in the Roman style, but with the addition of a commissary element, 
This action being then followed by the appointment of a dictator in order to get the thing done. However, implementing such a commissary dictatorship will not be easy, but for the reasons mentioned above, I believe it to be the most prudent course in order to avoid disaster. As I see it, this implementation would need to overcome two large hurdles, both of them of a social dimension. Firstly, the general will of the people is no longer a unified one. Rousseau, the progenitor of the idea of a general will of a people, would argue that such a will is unbreakable and indivisible. And I actually do believe that he is correct, that a people cannot have a divided general will. However, the political divides in our country are so apparent that nobody would be foolish enough to accept the idea that all Americans share a general will, that we all want the same thing. And this is because we as Americans are not at all one people, but in actuality several different peoples with irreconcilable and innate differences. It is in all of these discrete groups in which we see the various undivided general wills. And these differing wills with their mutually exclusive desires naturally turn the people against one another. The only solution to this problem is the forming of a new, unified general will. A realignment of values towards some common goal. The actual nature of the goal being less important than its congruence in the minds of the people at large. In other words, so long as all the members of society are moving towards a common goal, their wills aligned into one general will, the goal itself is of lesser importance. Now given that I just said our current general wills are mutually exclusive and mutually combative, this reformation of a new general will is going to involve the removal of dissidents, more often than not by means of force, an inevitability given just how strongly the current conflicting general wills oppose one another. The chance for life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, that is the ideal. I, I know no. very well our founding no. fathers were slave owners. Yes, and I know and very well that they probably did not imagine that America would be today what it is. They However, would have been appalled by the idea. Furthermore, what you're saying, yet, what you're saying is somehow whites were about to choke to death on their own homogeneity when people like yourself kindly arrived from diversity and saved us from ourselves. No, we built a wonderful country that your ancestors could not have been. That is why people like you come here. And the more you come in larger numbers, you will change the country my ancestors built into something else. And it is completely normal for me to wish to oppose that. Mr. Taylor, I've taken enough of your time. This may sound undesirable, but consider the alternative. The removal of some dissidents, whose ongoing participation in society perpetuates the existence of a divided general will, or the alternative, an absolute collapse of society, replete with all the dangers mentioned above. To put it simply, a country without a unified general will is doomed to failure. The restoration of this will is of primary importance. The second hurdle which would need to be overcome in order to implement a constitutionally legal dictatorship is the American people's fatalist clinging to the concepts of freedom, liberty, and democracy. Americans have, at least since World War II, been treated to decades of what can only be rightly called propaganda about why freedom, liberty, and democracy are not simply modes of government, but virtues in and of themselves. Many of these types actually believe that the idea of democracy itself is worth dying for risking their own lives to impose it upon others half a world away. They would attempt to foist the yoke of democracy on honeybees, to tell them that rule under a queen bee is oppressive and that the bee should be set free, of course only to see the hive collapse within a day. The real problem is that they do not recognize democracy for what it is, a mode of government, a means to an end. If at any point your means is no longer serving your ends, then you need to change your means. The fundamental purpose of a government is to maintain the existence of that country's constitution, and the purpose of a constitution is to maintain a country's people. If a government ever shows itself to be no longer capable of upholding its constitution, then the people ought to have no qualms about implementing a better government. Yet expecting the masses to act so rationally can't well be hoped for. Yes, you should not be able to sell heroin to a five-year-old. We can all of us already hear their cries of, but popular sovereignty. The people are the true holders of sovereignty. They can't just give it up to be held by one person. But guess what? If you own something, but you aren't at liberty to give it up to somebody, then you don't own it. You're just being allowed to pretend to own it. Not, of course, that this point will occur to any of these types. 
There will always be those who oppose dictatorship by leaning on such tired old battle cries, especially from the older baby boomer contingent. They will revel in their hollow slogans of freedom isn't free or don't tread on me. They'll feel so wise when they cite Sinclair Lewis's It Can't Happen Here, or the oft-used quote by James Waterman Wise, who said that fascism would come wrapped up in the American flag and heralded as a plea for liberty and preservation of the Constitution, a prediction which, for reasons I've stated above, was not so hard to arrive at. All of these faux arguments will be made by their thousands, yet they are all of them dishonest, as they do not address any of the points I've discussed here in good faith. Unfortunately, at least on the general populace, these arguments, which are really just hollow appeals, will be very effective because of how they leverage the average man's disdain for a word, disassociated with the particulars of that underlying idea the word is supposed to represent. They hate the word dictator. They hate the word fascism. And yet, especially with the latter, they can't even define what they mean. Their only possible defense is a questioning of fundamental morals and value judgments, which exist at the root of all opinion. Something to the effect of, have things really become that bad? And this really is the fundamental question of the matter. That question which must be decided, not in debate, but in the hearts of every individual as an article of faith. Have the social issues of our time become dire enough that our current form of government is no longer competent to handle them? Some, especially those who see the developments of increased crime, destructive monetary policy, an influx of non-productive and disproportionately criminal illegal immigrants as a net positive, will of course argue for a continuation of the status quo. Another vast contingent will of course just opt for an action, if only because they are still well-fed and sheltered. While I of course believe these people to be simply mistaken, a view which I'm sure is mirrored in them, this video will not be the form in which I try to convince them of the error of their thinking. I am a firm believer in that sort of dialectic, but it is outside of the scope of this video. The only solution to these sorts of supposed freedom lovers is to ignore them. Again, dialectic is always the preferable option, and if you value somebody personally, it is always worth your time to engage them in good faith about these issues. But for the broad masses who are so thoroughly in the thralls of the mainstream, there is no good faith ground that can be made, even in a lifetime, which is so significant as to be more valuable than concrete action. I will add as an addendum to this section that I do fully recognize in advocating this course of dictatorship, the politically prescient move would have been to veil my intents behind word games, to use a word other than dictator, or to advocate for the U.S. president taking dictatorial power in practice, but to keep the name president so as to keep up appearances. After all, I only just said how the masses only hate their words and not their underlying associations. People would almost assuredly get behind a strong figurehead in practice, so long as he is not called a dictator. They love nothing more than the politics and intrigues behind presidential elections. Every four years, the parties choose their golden calves, which people will then spend countless thousands of hours fawning over. You can't tell me that these people are averse to the idea of one individual holding power over them. So perhaps obfuscation would be the smarter move, but I cannot in good conscience advise the adoption of such backhanded tactics in regard to a political office which really represents the epitome of frankness and honesty. I believe, and the cynics would say foolishly so, that the sovereignty inherent to the people must be respected, and asking them to temporarily surrender it based on a lie is not a way to bring about a stable government in the time of the dictator nor afterwards. You want to kill your emperor? <laughs> Here I am. Vive Assuming we've now reached a point where by force or coercion, the people have been made to accept a dictator, we will still have to address some of the practical issues which may arise. 
There are of course dozens of questions which you could ask about my proposal, but as to not make this video too long, I will be addressing only the most prominent questions in the video itself. In the description below, you will find a link to a list of other questions and criticisms and my corresponding answers. First off, given that I come from what people would call the right wing, an inspecific but still useful classification, the first question to arise will be, what if the installed dictator is from the left wing, or of some other political viewpoint with which you disagree? The answer to this question has actually already been addressed within this video, if only indirectly, but I will now make it more explicit. One of the benefits to my idea of implementing a commissary dictatorship, as described above, is that they are installed directly out of a desire to defend the Constitution in its current form. And the Constitution is, I believe, inherently more right-wing at least in regards to the current practical definition of that term in the US. It would leave more of the so-called right-wingers happy if we were to govern in strict adherence to the Constitution. And not only would a commissary dictator be charged with preventing further stretches to the interpretation of existing laws, it would be a logical necessity that they be charged with a restoration of the ruling principles of the Constitution, which have deteriorated from intentional pressures exerted on them over the decades. It would not make sense to advocate a strict adherence to a document, but to allow any perversion of that document which had hitherto taken place to stand, a line which would be essentially arbitrarily decided by the time at which the dictator was appointed. I do understand that the body of US law is not so black and white as this, but broadly speaking this is no doubt true, and this will undoubtedly suffice for true in the mind of the average man. So in short, a commissary dictator would have a very difficult time maintaining power, were they to attempt to implement the current day left-wing platform. So now despite it being quite unlikely, I will still address the possibility that a left-wing dictator is installed to rule over the US. What would the average person who disagrees with their platform do to oppose them? The answer, as with all answers regarding dictatorship, is quite simple. If the American dictator supports the current left agenda, including open borders, big government, gun confiscation, expanded social welfare, in a word, universalist collectivism, then we rebel. All members of our military have already sworn allegiance to the Constitution and its ideals. They would be legally and ethically correct in staging a coup against said dictator. But then, hmm, wouldn't this left-wing autocrat just be an express means by which to implement the already steadily unfolding left-wing program? And wouldn't implementing a dictator to achieve their ends actually be overplaying their hand? a much too brazen move which would actually increase the likelihood of rebellion? Wouldn't the smart move just be to stay the course to guaranteed victory within a few decades? But maybe I'm getting too far into the weeds here. Suffice it to say, a left-wing commissary dictator would never happen, and if it did, the constitution would necessarily have to be discarded as incompatible with the new regime, and we would have chaos anyways. A dictator who rules in strict regards to the constitution is the only way to avoid large-scale bloodshed, due to our current era of societal upheaval. Now another obvious question arises. What can be done if this legally appointed commissary dictator decides not to relinquish his power at the end of his term? Especially if he has the loyalty of the military, there could be no force with which to actually take power back from him. First off, I will mention that a commissary dictator refusing to give up power would be the exception rather than the rule. Consider the example of the Roman dictator cited above, or that we've experienced for nearly 200 years a peaceable surrender of power in the office of the U.S. presidency, an office which holds the power to destroy the world through the U.S. nuclear arsenal. But none of this is to say that this still isn't a possibility, so I will address it here. If at the end of his term, or upon being ordered by their commissar, a dictator refuses to give up power, the solution, again, as with all things regarding a dictator, is very simple. If the dictator has popular support, such that the people are willing to continue to surrender their sovereignty to him, then why should he not rule? If the entire purpose of a government is to recognize and enact the general will of its people, why would we want to remove a government which is fulfilling that mandate? Of course I'm being a bit coy here. The real question people want answered is, what if the dictator refuses to give up power, has the military on his side, and is not popular among the people? Again, this is exceedingly unlikely given historical precedent set by other dictators, but in the case this did somehow happen, if the commissar who appointed the dictator deemed his time was done, yet the military and or the dictator himself thought otherwise and managed to stay in power, 
and the quality of his rule became such that the people prefer to take the risk of rebellion rather than remain under his rule, then they have every right to rebel in a commissary dictatorship. But if we ever got to this point, this would be no worse off than in our current situation. The worst case scenario, an exceedingly unlikely one, is that we end up no worse off than we are right now, at the point of rebellion. One last obvious criticism which would come from those on the political left is that this movement would simply be leveraging the conservative right-wing's love of the idea of the Constitution, while actually undermining said document by an imposition of autocratic rule. Well, yes, of course. But we wouldn't exactly be pulling the wool over anyone's eyes. This is exactly what we would be aiming at, to garner the support of the large contingent of conservatives in the U.S. by appealing to their ideals, which are also our ideals. But is this not the purpose of every political movement? To gather support through an appeal to shared values? I recognize fully the irony of employing autocratic rule in order to save liberalism, yet I still argue in favor of this course simply because it is the only possible course of action which does not see permanent autocratic rule of the peoples of the world. We will be making this appeal to the people as clearly and frankly as possible. Any who seek to undermine the idea of temporary autocratic rule by pointing out this supposed irony should be ignored. But the individual always knows what's best for them better than anyone else. Yeah, sure they do, buddy. But even assuming this were true, the continued existence of the individual is downstream of and contingent upon the continued existence of the people. Given that it is the people who are currently threatened, to remain focused on the individual is to poison the well by short-sightedness. And lastly, in order to preempt some of the more common labels which will be thrown my way for voicing these ideas, I want to make clear that my desire for a commissary dictator is in no way conservative in the popular sense of that word. Nor is it Christian, nor is it libertarian, because you know someone would try that for some reason. Although I do not have anything against anyone who may fall under any of these labels, I want to make clear that the appointment of a commissary dictator would represent a profound change to the country, such changes which cannot be neatly packaged up under a familiar label. As I've already mentioned, sweeping changes would be in order, including the destruction of the Federal Reserve, which would entail changes to the U.S. dollar. A temporary nullification of all branches of government save for one man and the executive, massive changes to immigration, changes to how banks can operate, indeed which banks can operate at all, an introduction of more isolationist policies, which in turn would require a smaller army, a reduction in foreign aid, and an elimination of the useless forever wars in the Middle East. Whether we appoint a dictator ourselves in the commissary style as I endorse, or one seizes power forcefully and becomes a sovereign dictator, radical changes such as these are coming, and I am simply not willing to play the coward who pretends they are not. I only want to get in front of this radical shakeup to society. The benefit of the commissary dictator is, I'll repeat it to get the point across clearly, that the relatively peaceful and smooth transfer of power involved would avoid a total collapse, allowing us to maintain a strong front against our enemies while we reform the country, rather than leaving us exposed for a period of a decade or more following a total collapse or fracture. So what say you all? The state of this country is untenable, arrived at from generations of complacency. Do we now ignore the coming consequences of our past inaction? Allow ourselves to be swallowed up and destroyed as the weak men will advocate? Or do we take action to save what we know to be good and what we know to be righteous? The greatest idea civilization has been blessed with, honor, freedom, the ideals of the enlightenment, all of them are standing at a precipice waiting to be destroyed if we, the last generation of defenders, fail now. I offer us a path forward, the only path which can maintain our country while we go about the difficult process of rebuilding from the rot which has set in and which many of us have only too recently discovered. The choice is not easy, but it is essential.